and welcome back to Watches Tonight, the number one live web show related to watches on YouTube. I'm Tim Masso, and this evening we have bad watch sales listings, including one from an unexpected source. A Patek purchase that apparently threatens a marriage, my choice between Breitling and Omega chronographs of reasonable price, Rolex bracelet evolution, Audemars Piguet limited edition overdose, and respect for Hublot. All of this plus fewer wrist shots tonight on watches tonight. I want to emphasize that there is no better place than thewatchbox.com to buy, trade, and sell your watches. We pay cash, we pay fast, and we make it easy. It's even more fun to buy watches on thewatchbox.com. It's where I browse for my next watches, and I'm not done as a collector. I'm taking a hiatus. It's going to be fun to get back in the game, and that's where I'm going to do it. I will pay you to check out our website, because we have a new giveaway watch for December. It is the Rolex Submariner 16610. That's right, an F-Series, no hole, stainless steel, 40 millimeter pre super case chronometer grade yes it has a date for you purists out there i'm sorry it's not a no date but it's a hell of a watch and i'm giving it away click the link in the description and it could be on your wrist this holiday season whether you celebrate christmas hanukkah festivus or other a rolex is right for the holidays batting practice warming up with your pitches and my cuts i was contacted repeatedly after the friday show um, regarding my thoughts on some of the content and i can only speak as tim masso watch collector so so speaking solely for myself, I think your watch purchases should be zero stress. I think you should never finance fun. I personally wouldn't finance or leverage my watches. I think you should sleep well at night and be comfortable with the decisions you make financially as a collector. I think this comes down to personal values, personal beliefs, and personal, I guess, capacity for risk. But I recommend first and foremost, make the right decision for you and make the decision that makes you feel comfortable so you can enjoy your watches to the fullest because at the end of the day, that's what collecting is about. We all have a different appetite for risk. Mine happens to be fairly low. With that said, hang on, I just got fired. No, but the show must go on. I kid, I kid. Okay, time to run where we call BS on the web's worst watch listings. Guys, viewer Ben's guy, a fellow gearhead, gets us up to speed and down to earth with a poorly written watch listing description field. And the offender is us. <laughs> so effectively me. <laughs> but here's the thing, guys. Uh, we should have sweated the details on this particular German Carré cased moon face. Sweating the details on this watch probably would have turned up a brand new brown alligator strap and a parent manufacturer in Saxony of Switzerland. Well, it's a brand new alligator strap and I guarantee you the watch is from Glashütte. So remedial spelling and geography may be in order. I take full blame for that one. Meanwhile, on Chrono 24, something more sinister and expensive is brewing. A seller is offering all three of the 1989 Chichere Lecoultre Grand Revive Perpetual Calendar Alarm pieces in one set. The problem, and this is the devil in the details, is that this is a sequential perpetual calendar adjusted with a pusher. One push equals one day, sequentially, over years. So, 365.25 days a year, there are three watches in the set, and they are set, respectively, to 2004, 2007 and 2008. Yes, you have to click through every day between then and now to get those three perpetual calendars up to speed. The problem is that the pusher adjuster is going to have to be pressed over 12,000 times collectively, and the underlying mechanism won't survive the ordeal. I've owned one of these. Don't count on more than a few hundred. Once you're into the thousands, you've mangled the metal, which means every single one of these watches is going to require a complicated service. Nod and move on. The problem here? Three services on perpetual calendar alarms with collectively over 1,000 movement components. That's a lot of service. And I'll take typos any day of the week over this. This is why you need to buy from a pre-owned seller who gives you a no questions asked return policy. Because I guarantee Unless you're a JLC geek or an IWC guy and you're looking for that year, you don't realize that these watches, which are outwardly beautiful, actually have colossal mechanical defects and service costs in the queue. So, help me name and shame improve the e-commerce ecosystem via survival of the fittest. Send your time to run bad watch listings to Monday Mailbag at thewatchbox.com. 
Before we jump headlong into your questions, and you have some good ones, a moment of shameless self-promotion. Please help me to reach 10,000 followers on Instagram. We are surging. There is real momentum behind the page. I'm adding over 120 new followers a day, and I promise to return the favor. World domination is hard, but I'm doing my best. Video reviews posted every day, start to finish, 60 seconds, you're up and away. My best watch reviews on your phone in a format you might not have seen from me. If you like my videos, you'll love my Instagram. Peter Yu asks, Hi Tim, I'm in big trouble. I mean totally screwed. Forgive me, but I had a $47,000 opportunity through a friend at a Patek Philippe Nautilus 5711 silver white dial. And I pulled the trigger late at night while admittedly slightly warm from a late dinner and a brown liquor. Now, this isn't a financial burden for me, but there's going to be a huge trust blow up in our house. I've never spent more than five grand without first consulting with my wife and receiving her permission. And I think she's going nuclear as, sh as soon as she realizes what I have done. Okay, Peter, this is starting to feel awfully Ray Donovan. First, only you know how many kilotons of nuclear your wife is going to launch, so I'll offer two solutions depending on what DEF CON level you are looking at personally. If you suspect to be busted imminently, you have no time to get out of this and expect nothing more as a result than a tense DEF CON 1 awkward moment, and we know those awkward moments. That's kind of what it looks like. Those are survivable. Advanced preparation of reciprocity might defuse the issue. Shopping as a couple, perhaps a surprise gift of sufficient magnitude, or a vacation long discussed. All of these might get you off scot-free, and then you can keep the Nautilus. Now, that might get you off the hook if we're looking at low stakes. But here's the thing. If this is DEF CON 5 for your relationship, by the way, Eddie says hi, then it's time for a serious bit of luxury laundering. Okay, I just told you off of sketchy money concepts. Well, this is going to be the sketchiest of all, and I take full blame for anything that may result in your marriage. First, sell the Nautilus instantly to somebody who will pay cash up front. It doesn't have to be us. Any pre-owned seller will be happy to own this watch for $42,000. So, Possibly, you might even make a bit more because they might be able to sell it for over 50. You mentioned 47 was a good deal, right now it is. You might be able to get out with minimal losses. Then, buy something for her and something for you with the proceeds. Pitch this after the fact as a wholly planned holiday gesture because people tend not to ask too many questions or request permission before you buy holiday gifts. You're kind of off the hook there. So do this, get yourself something fun. You're not gonna come out of this with nothing. Buy yourself a zero. In 104 in steel. So you're looking at at most 1400 US dollars outlay for a watch that you're going to enjoy wearing. And here's the thing it looks more expensive. It looks like it might even cost two to three times retail or even four. If she doesn't know watches well, you might be in a good place here. Then, Buy her something worth three to four thousand dollars. You'll know best what she prefers to make your choice. Now you're likely out total ten thousand dollars or less, even with the loss on the Patek Philippe. And you can plausibly claim that each item purchased amounted to the previously established five grand threshold. You see, am I an operator here? I should work on the sales floor. I would be such a dealer. Now, here's the thing. Because you've established that level, and because these are holiday gifts, and you don't go out and ask what the price breakdown of holiday gifts is, you should should be okay as long as she's not looking closely at the actual transaction history. No one's going to pry too deeply into the exact cost of holiday exchanges. So you might be golden. Think about it next time. Look before you leap, especially when a Nautilus is involved. So I will say this. If she looks at the transaction history, then you're on your own. But I recommend, always a great excuse, blaming North Korean hackers. They're always at it. You know they're there, she can't prove they're not, and this has some precedent from previous holiday seasons. That was the best Christmas movie that wasn't a Christmas movie. The glorious leader strikes again. Honey, I'm sorry. You know, the North Koreans, what can I do? It's a national security crisis. On a separate topic. Hi Tim, from Hassan A. Can you give us a quick overview of the Omega Caliber 8900 and the Rolex 3235? I'm looking at an Omega Aquaterra and a Rolex Datejust 41 with these movements, but they're also found in a million other products from those brands. Let me quickly acknowledge some of our friends joining us around. I can see Mark S. saying laugh out loud Zen after having a Nautilus. Don't undersell Zen, that's a tough watch and a looker. The 104 is a great piece. And I can see right here Richard Atkinson is saying make sure she never sees this video. So 
clear your browser history pronto. PY7 saying, I love these first world problems. Don't we just? Angels on the head of a pin. Late Renaissance scholasticism at its best. Horology homies joining from New York City and Derek P saying, pick up the Piaget Polo S. Finally, we've got hello from Mama's Basement. Dawn K joining us around. And JPG saying, geez, I would cry every time I wore the darn thing versus the Nautilus. It's not so bad. Finally, Aaron joining from Brisbane, Australia. Welcome, guys, and welcome five-year waitlist and Camille. VDBDG, a fan of the Aqua Terra. We're not there yet. Okay, let's take a look at the movement. Rolex 3235, automatic 70-hour power reserve. This is the new generation of standard Rolex automatic. So a three-day power reserve like what you see on a Daytona, COSC, and then it gets the superlative chronometer certification. What is that? Well, COSC is minus four plus six per 24 hours, loosely speaking. And superlative is Rolex's term for a fully cased up watch, a finished product, not a bare movement, that'll make minus two plus two seconds per day or better. So that's what you're getting with the 3235. Now, stop seconds, quick set date, tough architecture, overcoil hairspring, maybe a bit more stable in different positions than the Omega. Finally, it features the Chronergy escapement and Leica escapement etching tech. Rolex put in a lot of not well advertised tech, some of it borrowed from the microchip industry into this movement. At the end, it's thinner than the Omega, probably easier to service locally if you must, and probably tougher at the limit because of the lack of a silicon hairspring. But Omega Mega, caliber 8900, the master chronometer. Automatic 60 hour power reserve, not as good as the Rolex, but with twin mainspring barrels, it probably keeps better time at full wind and minimum wind at the extremes of the power reserve. It has a time zone function, so you have the ability to move the hour hand separately from the seconds and minutes, and you can drive the date forward and backward without hazard to the movement. So you have a little bit of flexibility if you're a world wanderer with the 8900 that you don't get with the Rolex. It is a COSC certified chronometer, but it also meets the Metas standard, not a five position adjustment of a bare movement a fully cased up six position test with full eight test Swiss Federal Institute of Metrology evaluation, which means everything from winding efficiency to power reserve to water resistance to anti-magnetism, and with the ability to withstand a medical MRI. That is the tougher caliber if magnetism is taken into account. Coaxial tech, probably better for travelers, this movement. Uh, more interesting from a tech perspective with the Daniels coaxial escapement. Can you believe it's 20 years since the first Omega coax coming up in 2019? And of course, amagnetic. Both movements now feature a five-year warranty, so nothing to tell in that respect. You're covered by both of these great companies. Jumping into the chat box right here, Tim Lindbergh saying, love you, Tim. I reciprocate the uh, amorous expression, and I can see Lay Bass joining from the UK. Welcome. Mesa Sean saying, next piece will be that CHNR two-tone with the new movement. That is one hell of a GMT. You will not be disappointed. And a wonderful use of two-tone in the first ever rose gold and steel two-tone GMT. So it's a first, and first is a flag historically that flies forever. I can see Kenny Sharp join in from Massachusetts. Tim Lindbergh is from Chicago. His birthday is coming up. Happy birthday, Tim. Ehud G asking, Tim, okay, this is a Breitling versus Omega either or. So would you opt for the new Breitling Premier Chronograph 42 Blue or the Omega Speedmaster Moonwatch Sapphire Sandwich? They seem similar in fit and price, and I do like both of them. Okay. Ehud, I'm going to do some thinking for you, but you have to make the final decision so you're happy with the watch. My advice, pick the one that looks best to you on your wrist, because if it doesn't look right, nothing else about history or movement matters. So let's start with the Premier, the Challenger. The Premier, resume, on the bracelet, as shown, 6550 US dollars, launched 2018, a late year launch in October. References several handsome 1940s and 1950s Breitling Premier models, so there is some history here. And it's 100 meters water resistant to the 50 of the Omega, and it's automatic winding to the manual of the Omega. Far more detailed dial that looks much more expensive than the watch's $6,500 price. I have to say, this is where it looks like Georges Kern and his team really put their energy and their Swiss francs. So a COSC chronometer, the Omega is not, and it has a date feature, which is important to some, and anchored at six o'clock, it's also a nicely balanced use of a date. Now, the moon watch, sapphire sandwich, as specified, Ehud, you're getting a great watch for 6,250 US dollars on a bracelet. You can't see the display case back, but you got a sapphire on both sides of this watch, no moon watch thermoplastic. Visible, Omega manual wind caliber 1863, and I can tell you from examining this movement, I can't 
confirm that this is not a hand-finished movement, at least in part. In particular, some of the bridges and chronograph levers look so perfectly executed with rounded mirrored bevels that I would not bet against those parts of this movement being hand-finished, and that's a rarity in an Omega mass-produced piece. Also, display case back. The Premier not for the 7750 powered model we just discussed. More affordable by $300 than the Premier and unrivaled history. The Moon Watch is the real deal. Historically flown, still flown today by NASA. You get a full box full of awesome stuff for your 6250. You get a loop, you get a strap tool, you get spare spring bars, you get a second strap, you get a big ceremonial box and all this for $300 less than the Breitling. A boxed set you'll actually want and use, maybe even show off to your friends. That's cool. Finally, you now get a five-year warranty on every Omega sold. Breitling has a longer warranty on in-house calibers, but this particular Premier with the 7750 is not one of them. So it's five-year Omega warranty versus two for Breitling, and Omega dominates the loom shot. I wish I had one, but the Moon Watch is fully loomed, including chrono seconds, and on the Breitling Premier, you only have the hour and the minute hands. My choice in Agri, I think the Moon Watch wins this by a mile. Unless you need to swim with it, you need a date, or you just can't live without automatic winding, that's your winner right there and still champion. Jumping into the chat box, I can see right here, Josh Beverly is recommending the Omega Ultraman and VDBDG saying, I managed to have Tim say VDBDG at 7 a.m. here, but my day has already reached its peak. Hopefully it gets better from here. I don't want to be the highlight. Let this be an upward trajectory like that Saturn V. Wrist shots, viewer wrist shots. Tony L. from the UK via Brooklyn Global Audience World Wanderers showcases his adopted home and his Rolex Sea Dweller 43 50th anniversary. Ryan D. rolls in Audi and wears Zenith. Ryan D., a man after my own heart with his Chronomaster El Primero Show of Remote Limited Edition in honor of the man who saved the El Primero movement in 1975. Alec T. from Hong Kong welcomes his new Pepsi GMT Steel Jubilee with a family shot alongside his traditional explorers. And Jonah S features Angels and Angelus, a vintage chronodato with cherubic onlookers, nicely composed, superb depth of field, and unusual watch. I appreciate them all. Send your pictures to Monday Mailbag at thewatchbox.com to see your analog on my digital. Jumping into our primary feature for the night. By the way, the Watch Lounge, join in from Myrtle Beach. Welcome aboard, Watch Lounge. And I can see right here, we have a friend from Johannesburg, South Africa. Kitometse, I believe. That's how it's Kitometse M. Am I mangling that? I'm going to try to get that right because you're a regular on the show and I appreciate that. Primary feature, brands that kicked the habit. The goal of a luxury watch brand is to offer the best product at the best price with the fewest compromises in quality, richness, durability, or functionality. With reputations in danger from too many compromises in the wrong areas, the following brands realize that it's better to check yourself and raise your game than to wreck yourself and burn your reputation. Yoda has it right. Not in order, but he has it right. So Audemars Piguet, let's get started. The watch brand that truly turned it upside down and then turned it around. Too many offshore limited editions, too much dilution of the brand during the 2000s. We all remember it. Let's see where it started. Well, the first Audemars Piguet Royal Oak Offshore Limited Edition was 1999's Royal Oak Offshore End of Days. Named for the Arnold Schwarzenegger film End of Days, which nearly ended Arnold's career even as the watch launched a decade plus onslaught of Audemars Piguet Limited limited editions, the watch was more memorable than the movie. Just take my word for it. Don't subject yourself. Seriously, though, there were offshores during this period that followed. For true superstars like Arnold and Shaq, no doubt, there were important and memorable pieces. But also for relatively minor F1 drivers like Yarno Trulli, Sebastian Buemi, who barely wheeled a car with his super license. Events few have heard of, like the Tor Auto, and there were multiple Tor Autos. And statements of truly questionable taste, like the 2008 Insectoid Royal Oak Offshore Survivor. All of that, and there were plutocrat specials like the Pride of Argentina, Russia, and Mexico. So it didn't help that the last few arrived amid global economic upheaval when this kind of conspicuous consumption and over-the-top bombast was generally frowned upon. All of that changed in 2012 with new CEO Francois-Henri Bonamia. 
In 2012, he really began turning the ship around, realizing that less in its way would be more, and that includes the photo corruption. We're still getting the message across. So here's what happened. Fewer limited editions, more focus on the core Royal Oak and Royal Oak offshore collections, and less outright production across the entire brand. All of this helped to right the ship and restore the luster of the Audemars Piguet nameplate. When AP does a Royal Oak Offshore limited edition today, it's for a true A-lister like LeBron James. Something that's truly worthwhile, memorable, rare, and exquisite. Not a 1,000 piece tribute to some guy who's barely an F1 test driver like we saw too many times during the 2000s. Today, AP is one of the strongest brands on the market and the Royal Oak Offshore Collection has become an object of increasing contempt in the late 2000s now a rock and a pillar of the Le Brasseau manufacture. Not just riding the ship, but riding the ship and recovering full steam ahead with a bone in the teeth, AP truly has momentum. That is, aside from the dress watches, AP still has to show that it can build and sell dress watches, but Audemars is starting that journey from a position of robust strength thanks to prior reforms with the offshore limited editions. And I'll also say, bump, 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 Rolex, uncompetitive clasps and bracelets. Between you and me and Geneva, you know it was true. The basic Rolex bracelet circa 2001 was behind the times even then. I dreamed of a Rolex sub 16610 in high school, but then I went to try one at Tourneau in the Roosevelt Field Mall. You Long Islanders, you know exactly what I'm speaking of. You probably know the spot in the mall too. And although it's great to get one of these for free in our giveaway, and I'm gonna do that, I tried this instead back in 2001. Omega's clasp on the Bond SMP, the 2531 back then, felt like a piece of aerospace hardware compared to the tinsel-like Rolex oyster clasp and hollow link bracelet. Seriously, that thing is tin foil. You could wrap your sandwich for lunch in that clasp. But I chose the Omega Diver 300 meter to blow my graduation money and I never looked back. So here's what happened. Rolex came roaring back to the front of the industry, its customary position, with the Super Jubilee bracelet on the 2005 Datejust. This was the beginning of a hard charge that continues to this day. And an Oyster bracelet that same year, built like a battleship's anchor chain on the 2005 GMT Master. This was a total turnaround from where the company had been. This time, it was Rolex that never looked back. Today, Rolex clasp internals are famously sophisticated with robust locking systems and micrometric adjustment devices built right in. The sophistication of a Rolex clasp today is top of the market. They feel like a safe in a bank or the bar cages in Fort Knox itself. And I'll even mention that the Deep Sea, Rolex's hardest core sports watch, features the world's best diving class, bar none. Rolex going from an also ran to pacing the field. That's how good a turnaround Rolex pulled off and it continues to this day. Bracelet today is spelled R-O-L-E-X. I will also say, when you're getting creative with tinsel this holiday, Spare a thought for the hollow end link, hollow center link, stamped class Rolex sports watches of yore, which would have been lucky to sport links as solid as the ghost of Christmas past, seen right here. The Muppet Christmas Carol, a highlight of my childhood, and still beloved, Marley and Marley. Statler and Waldorf. <laughs> Again, if you were there, if this was part of your experience, like the Roosevelt Field Mall Tourneau, you recognize it. If not, I'm totally off the reservation there. Hublot! Premium prices and basic customer calibers were its weakness back in the day. And let's be honest, prior to 2005, expectations of the obscure and fading Hublot brand, which had its heyday in the 1980s, well, they were modest. It wasn't a designer name, it wasn't high horology, and there wasn't much of a collector community by the watches behind the watches to sustain the brand or the buzz for the Hublot. All of that changed in 2005 with the Big Bang. Suddenly there was buzz, there was a collector community, there was momentum. Sounds good, right? And with ETA value power in almost all of the watches, that's reliable and sturdy. So what's the problem? Well, what's the problem? That's the problem. A 7750 and a $14,000 watch that you can also find in a $1,400 Mito. So, if you want AP image, you need to offer AP substance, and Hublot did. Already investing in a manufacturer movement base during the mid-2000s, the company 
brought its in-house caliber 1240 Unico three-day power reserve automatic flyback chronograph to market in the 2010 King Power Unico, and it's been nothing but a sprint from there. Launched in 2012, the Hublot Ferrari followed, and then in 2013 there was the Big Bang Unico, finally uniting the Unico with Hublot's Icon watch. And the new caliber has become a mainstay across the range. In the meantime, at the absolute top of the collection, Hublot bought its insolvent Haute Horlogerie partner, BNB Concept, in 2010 to rival Audemars Piguet, Renault et Papy, the people who build the complications and almost all of the high-end Richard Mule watches. So this enabled the Lightning Rod Hublot brand to build watches like the MP05 LaFerrari Aperta, a 50-day power reserve tourbillon under its own roof. And Hublot does discretion too, believe it or not, but the 2013 ultra-thin Classico Classic Fusion model gave us a 2.9 millimeter thick 90 hour power reserve manual wind movement. That's right, the ultra thin from Hublot is a surprisingly discreet watch available in 42 millimeters if you want, with the thickness of a Royal Oak Jumbo from Hublot. Who knew? I'll also say this those are my hand on the Hublot. Classic Fusion Cathedral Tourbillon Minute Repeater. It is exquisite. 99 pieces in titanium, and this one sings. I've seen it, guys, so I know it's real, and all that done under Hublot's own roof. And that's without speaking of the Mecha 10, 10 day manual wind power reserve caliber 1201 with the Meccano styled bridges and plates. That with, that's without speaking of magic gold that looks like bronze but has the hardness of ceramic. That's without speaking of Hublot's clever GMT and retrograde complications based on the Unico or the brilliant quick release strap systems. So. You don't have to love Hublot. You can even hate it. It's a love-hate brand, but you can no longer call it crude. Viewer wrist shots. Let me first acknowledge some friends in the chat box right here. I can see friends saying, Abdul Rahman saying, let's hope that the giveaway will be available in Europe soon. Watching here at half past midnight from the Black Forest in Germany. Abdul, you are a regular on the show, and I really appreciate you tuning in. You're going to be happy because your wrist shot is coming up. I'm glad you stuck with us. And I can also say, Rich Buddy saying, I got the three ceramic subs and a Batman. I don't think Explorer or any Oyster Perpetual would be, would be something I want to add. I love the I love the game within the game. The comment chats that are going as I'm raconteuring. And I can see right here, Mayweather still rocking the Hublot from BS. That's a fact. Mayweather and many others. Viewer wrist shots. Abdul R from Germany showcasing, he actually sent me a whole bevy of photos. I picked this one showcasing his vintage Eldor chronograph from the mid-century in the midst. A gorgeous photo from the Black Forest. Damien L has two watches in one with his JLC Reverso tribute calendar. That's probably one of the highlight pieces of 2016, the 85th anniversary reversos. Joost B strikes a casual pose, nicely composed, with his Panner IPAM 338, a gorgeous wire lug rod. And Michael D of New Jersey is killing it with his Vacheron Constantin Overseas Chronograph Generation 3. I love the color, the composition, the watch, epic. I can't top that. You've had the last word. Well, sort of. You've had the last image. Let me remind you to send your wrist shots to Monday Mailbag at thewatchbox.com to see your pieces on my pixels. And our December watch. The Rolex Submariner. I'm giving you an F Series 16610, but you got to be in it to win it. We're announcing our drawing on December 31st. And if you are our winner of the Tudor Black Bait Black, you really need to get in contact with us. Uh, you got to reach out to me because we haven't heard from you yet. I've announced the winner previously, and I want to say, let's see, it was I believe it was Mark who won. Let me double check this because this actually matters, and I feel genuinely awful. If our dude doesn't get the win. Okay, I'm going to put this in the chat below. The winner will be announced in the description below this video when it posts. Guys, remember, enter, but also claim your prize. Both are equally important. Finally, comment and subscribe. Check below the video. I want to hear what you think. And visit me on Instagram, will you? Tim underscore Masso. 60-minute video reviews from the guy who's probably done more than anyone else on the internet. Thank you so much. Thanks to you. Thanks to my crew. Time out, Tim out, and thank you for logging on.